There's a term in the military called broken arrow. And, you know, when a field officer picks up the mic and says broken arrow, what it basically means is that the enemy has gotten through all of the perimeter defenses and they're inside of the camp. And I would just start yelling broken arrow all the time to corporate America, because if you don't know that they're inside your firewall, you've got an even bigger problem. <laughs> they're in and they're getting in. Welcome to the Reimagining Cyber Podcast, where we share short and to the point perspectives on the cyber landscape. It's all about engaging yet casual conversations on what organizations are doing to reimagine their cyber programs while ensuring their business objectives are top priority. With my co-host, Stan Wisseman, Head of Security Strategist, I'm Rob Borrego, Chief Security Strategist, and this is Reimagining Cyber. So Stan, who do we have joining us for this episode? Rob, Bob Allman is the Chief Operating Officer of Full Armor Corporation, a software development firm he co-founded, and Bob has over 20 years of experience creating and bringing to market security enterprise management products that are used by more than 1,000 enterprise customers worldwide. Bob, it's great to have you with us today. Can you expand a little bit more on your background for our audience? Absolutely, and uh, thank you, Rob and Stan, for uh, having me on. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to talk about a subject that uh, means a lot to us. Um, so myself and a couple of partners founded Full Armor Corporation, um, as you said, 20 plus years ago. Uh, our DNA is really security. Um, we grew up in that space going without dating myself too much, going out uh, uh, back to the days of uh, file and directory and hard drive uh, locking. Um, and we've really, uh, we've really had a great run um, watching the industry evolve and change and, and go from, you know, everything being based on, you know, single machines to internal networks to the growth to the internet and just this now explosion of, you know, uh, people working wherever they want to work and whenever they want to work and needing to have access to everything. So, um, you know, we're, uh, we're a, a highly... Um, uh, innovative development shop. Uh, we love the stuff that we do and uh, the folks that we partner with and the customers that we get to serve. So uh, hopefully that's enough on on me for now. No, that's great. That's great. And I, and I, I personally have a, a history with security policies in the sense that in the mid 90s, I was teaching classes on how to do security policies. And I helped create a security policy for Exodus Communications back in 98. And you know, what you've done is you're, 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 you come up with these corporate policies, which are great shall statements, right? But how do you actually get them implemented? You know, and how do you help ensure they're consistently being deployed? And as you look at how, you know, Windows has turned to be sort of like that core um, focus with Active Directory and, and as a way of actually helping implement policies, you know, what were some of those initial pain points so that you helped the IT admins deal with as they're trying to help, you know, flow down those policies from the corporate high level shall statements down to reality. Yeah. So I, I'm starting to wonder whether or not I should be interviewing you based on uh, <laughs> you know, some of your history, but um, so, yeah, if you, you know, going back to what I was uh, saying sort of during my intro, um, you know, there were there was a day when when, you know, having a password on your computer meant your computer was pretty protected. And as long as you didn't leave it at, uh, you know, Walmart or the airport, you know, the chances of somebody having the time to break into it was, you know, you were pretty safe that you were, you know, the worst thing that was going to happen is they'd format the hard drive and they'd sell it uh, to somebody else as a new computer. Well, those, those, um, have, those days have changed, haven't they? <laughs> yeah, they, they definitely have. And. You know, the, the evolution for us really started back in the, the mid to late 90s with Microsoft system policy. And there they were really trying to take, you know, what was the Wild West at the time and, and sort of rein it in and apply policies to individuals and to all of the corporate assets, um, you know, that the company needed to manage, whether it was the physical assets like computers or um, you know, networks and, and, you know, different storage devices and things like that. Um, and then in 2000, Microsoft uh, came out with uh, Microsoft Active Directory and this new policy vehicle called Group Policy or GPO's Group Policy Objects. 
And uh, our company was sort of uniquely positioned at the time because of all the work that we had been doing around system policy and in the really, really early days of access and, um, you know, policy management were really all we were doing was, you know, creating, you know, one, two or three policy levels and based on a, you know, a user's login, you would give them limited, you know, either almost no access limited access or full access. And, you know, if somebody was an IT administrator, well, the default was full access. And if somebody was a user like me, it was little or no access. Um, but with, uh, with group policy in Active Directory, um, the ability to manage at a granular level exploded. And I think initially there were like 800 settings in every individual group policy object. And you're like, oh my goodness, how do you go from three to 800? Um, and, you know, over time, that's actually now grown to, I think, over 6,000 individual settings in a GPO. So, you know, what, what we focused on was what we could do to help the IT administrators in these enterprises manage all of those settings and manage, you know, the, the ability to apply, you know, policy dynamically to their users and the company, you know, uh, corporate assets in a way that actually made sense so that you didn't have policy overlap or drift and all this other stuff. Um, and what we've seen in really over the last, you know, 20 plus years hasn't just been that increase from 800 to 3000 to 6000 uh, different settings, you know, which those settings have to come from somewhere. Well, that, that was really the expansion of what a network meant, both on premise and then, you know, wide area networks and then the, the, you know, the internet coming into play and then all the applications that can be hosted in a, you know, whether a SaaS application or, or things that you're hosting inside of your network. And now there were, I mean, virtually millions of settings that could be applied inside your network dynamically. And our focus was trying to rein that in and make it easier for the IT administrator to manage all of those settings, but really focus on, on security and protecting the organization from the inside out. Um, and that's really been the evolution for us to go from you know, 1995 to 2022. So, so, Bob, I think you just started touching upon the security aspect of it, right? Because if the listeners are kind of coming in and saying, we're talking about policy management, we're talking about configuration settings and whatnot on the Windows environments, you know, and what's the cybersecurity aspect? Well, there's there's a lot that's going on, as you, you've been talking about. We've had conversations in the past, and it's not just now at this point around the Windows environment, right? It's expanded itself into the other types of operating systems out there, cloud environments, devices, mobile devices, and so on. So maybe you can kind of set the specific on, um, you know, different approaches from the cyber perspective related to policy management to help the listeners kind of understand that interconnection point. Sure. Um, well, I, you know, we could do, we could probably do a full day of, you know, talking about zero trust and, and uh, you know, cyber resiliency um, and the way that is, you know, uh, growing and expanding and, and morphing into something that that is really, I think, very powerful for, um, you know, the CISOs and the IT administrator and, and, you know, heads of security inside a company. We could just dive into that for, for hours and hours. But at a high level, you know, what we've seen with the expansion of, you know, the company footprint, all of the for lack of a better term, call it all of the new surface areas that they have to cover and manage, all of those surface areas eventually become potential attack surfaces for bad actors, whether inside or outside of the organization. And, um, you know, the cyber play in this is, I, you know, I think uh, in a past conversation, we talked about um, the evolution from the early 2000s where almost everything um, you know, was on premise and there were these connections to the cloud to go out and get, you know, things from the, the internet or from a hosted environment that was also behind a firewall. And then you saw this evolution to SaaS applications and the explosion of the use by employees. And this um, uh, industry term came uh, into place called shadow IT. 
So shadow IT basically meant that, you know, an individual IT administrator could go out and provision an app for a bunch of its users, say somebody wanted to use something like Salesforce and they didn't really have permission all the way up the stack, but they went out and they signed up for a trial, you know, <laughs> um, license for Salesforce. And the next thing that, oh, they convince somebody and they're paying for five or six licenses. And you have an IT administrator that's running security for the organization and they don't even know that this hosted application by Salesforce is being used. And that just exploded. I mean, every area of, of you know, management, sales management, marketing, HR, there are apps for all of these things that are out there. And they really exploded in a dynamic way and not always with the permissions of the IT administrator going up the, the corporate um, food chain to the CISO. And so, when they finally woke up to the reality that their users weren't just doing everything the way they were supposed to on-prem, but they were finding dynamic ways to, you know, achieve better productivity and higher sales results and, and faster, you know, production of whatever the, the you know, services or, or products that they were building, IT then couldn't say, well, we're going to shut all those things down and we're going to rein you back in. They literally had to now say, all right, how are we going to manage all of these crazy things that are out there all over the place? And sometimes we don't even have control over. Um, and that was really the explosion of this, this on-premise and, and cloud hybrid lifestyle for employees that has created such a, a diverse set of additional attack surfaces for bad actors to go after. Um, I think I've mentioned to you guys in the past that, you know, some of the biggest hacks have started on resources that were completely innocuous in the eyes of the organization. Um, I hope I'm not quoting this wrong, but the, I believe it was the target hack that led to, you know, millions of views of data being exposed and, and stolen and put out there in, on the dark web. It started with the hack of a simple Linux device that was controlling the HVA system, you know, at an office building. And the bad actors got into that because, you know, security wasn't super tight. People weren't paying that close attention to something that seemed like a, you know, well, what are they going to do? Turn our heat up, turn our heat down. And the next thing you know, they elevated the privileges on that device and they moved laterally throughout the organization until they were inside of you know, uh, customer records and, and financial information and data. And the organization, it took them quite a while to actually figure out what's going on because they, they weren't prepared for what now we, we talk about zero trust and we talk about cyber resiliency. They didn't have, you know, when these things were going on, a really good set of precepts and principles to apply policy in a dynamic way that will protect you on the inside and the outside and in the complete life cycle of those devices and those users that are coming into the organization to do their jobs, no matter how innocuous the, the job or the, the device might be. Um, so we've really seen an explosion in that. And, um, you know, we're excited to be, you know, one of the companies that are out there that are, that are putting really fun resources together for IT administrators going up the food chain. Um, you know, to protect themselves and to follow best practices uh, to secure all of those uh, resources. So, so Bob, I and mean, one aspect of the security governance is that visibility, right? I mean, the, the, they at, at Target, they didn't necessarily have the visibility into that Linux server to know what the settings were. The, the difference silos that you've got that either are on-prem or, you know, in the cloud, um, as, as far as the, the, the challenge of getting that visibility in a way that they can actually manage effectively the policies and ensure that they're, because one of the key things is consistency, right? You, you, you want to have a consistent set of access rules that can be you know, applied no matter where the you know, individual user or entity is, is in the environment, right? And so as that perimeter has expanded, as we've gotten into a hybrid approach, maintaining that consistency of policy implementation, getting the visibility to validate that it truly is consistent is part of the challenge you're trying to solve, right? Yeah, that's correct. Um, you know, when we think about zero trust and when we think about cyber resiliency, 
you know, I have to go back to, um, again, industry standards, things that, that, you know, have been evolving over the last 10 years to deal with these really complex issues. And when we look at, you know, I think there are, I won't go into all of them, but, you know, I think there are eight pillars, um, you know, of the zero trust, you know, world. And you've got users, obviously, and devices, networks, infrastructure, applications, data, blah, blah, blah. And all of those things now have to be looked at holistically. You have to look at them inside the organization and say, you know, here are these eight sets of resources that we have to have a consistent, um, you know, zero trust methodology for managing. And then we have to apply the standards that are both, you know, industry-wide standards, um, you know, best practices, along with a, a host of applications and security solutions. Um, you know, I'm going to pivot for a quick second and, and you know, say two things that, that we're seeing in the industry. A lot of folks, a lot of companies that are out there are trying to sell a product, which in most instances is a point solution or solves one or two of these problems in the zero trust universe. And they're selling them as zero trust. That's not the right way to look at this. Zero trust is much, much bigger. I mean, I talked about those, uh, you know, eight pillars. Well, then we get into the seven tenets of what zero trust is. And you talk about, you know, the rigorous enforcement of authentication and authorization. You're talking about maintaining your data integrity, gathering, uh, you know, the, the information around improved security, um, you know, granting, you know, access to resources dynamically, you know, how you audit and how you report and how you alert on all of those things. Those all play into the seven tenets of zero trust. So going back to your question, when we think about, you know, how we're going to be resilient and how we're going to, um, you know, help, you know, this battle to get to zero trust, we think about policy in a really dynamic way. We think about, you know, policy in the full life cycle of what it is to, to create, approve, deploy, manage, audit against, and then be resilient in making sure that the appropriate policies are being enforced at all times. And, you know, that policy enforcement, you know, is, is sort of the, the end of that food chain, but it starts with the very, the very inception of, of creation of a policy for a user or a device or all of those things that, you know, we were talking about earlier is the corporate assets. And for us, I think what we're looking towards is how can we apply dynamic policy? How can we have the appropriate zero trust methodology in place from the creation of that policy? Who reviews it and approves it? How it get to, gets deployed? Then once it's deployed, a whole new set of rules, rights, and restrictions go into place that go against the reporting on it and the auditing on it and the alerting when changes are made and how you roll back to the correct policy or approve and let a new policy go into place to enforce that the users and the devices and all of those corporate assets stay in compliance at all times. So that's, that's a really exciting, you know, space to be in in our industry right now, because there are just so many different policy silos out there. You mentioned MDM, um, you know, we've got Linux and Unix and Mac and non Windows joined devices that are out there in the wild. We've got MDM for your mobile devices. We've got, you know, network security. And then you throw in things like, you um, uh, you know, the way you authenticate and, and um, authorize, you know, using two-factor authentication and, and strict passwords and forcing password changes. All of these things, you know, happen in different policy silos. And what we're trying to do is normalize all those policies down into one centralized policy that you can see in a single pane of glass and then from cradle to grave, inception and creation, all the way through auditing and enforcement, manage those in a dynamic way for the organization. And we think it's really, really exciting. I'm sure there are a lot of people that just heard that last three minutes of my soliloquy and are thinking, wow, Bob, that's pretty boring. But for us, <laughs> it's actually really, really exciting. So, Well, well I think it's, it's, it's critically important is what it comes down to, right? As you said about um, kind of holistic, persistent policy management. 
right? It's not back as you started our conversation, the Windows based environments and dealing with, you know, the settings there of 800 to 6,000 GPO settings. That's one thing. Never mind the other environments that you're talking about, right? Going to Linux, to the Unix, to the cloud environments, mobile devices, and so on. But the persistent aspect of it or dynamic aspect of it, you kind of use both the words interchangeably, right? It's, it's really what you're driving at. So to me, what that does is it plays a major theme about the resiliency factor that you also alluded to, right? So a lot of organizations, and we've been talking to many different people about this, you know, the emphasis around how can we be more resilient in our cyber programs, right? Not just the cybersecurity aspect of kind of good hygiene, which this falls into, but this expands now into being more strategic in how they're actually protecting the organization from the target type of attacks that you talked about and many other types of misconfigured type systems and security, right? So that's, that's critical. Now, just kind of, Bob, take out the crystal ball for a second, right? Put on that wizard cap and tell me, like, what is it that you're seeing out there going forward? What, what's the vision next phase of this? Yeah, so, I, you know, I think I alluded to it a little bit, um, uh, you know, based on the last question. And I think what we're seeing is the real necessity um let me let me take it in three pieces you've you've got to create this awareness for the it administrator you know of of what that global set of problems are and all of those different attack surfaces and you have to help them understand that protecting you know if an organization has seven different attack surfaces you know protecting four of the the most important means that two or three become the focus of the bad actors and they're going to get in. I, I hear all the time from IT administrators, I don't really have to worry about that. All my important assets are behind the firewall and we use VPN. Oh, great. Yeah, because so did T-Mobile and JP Morgan and the, the good folks at Target and, you know, how many federal government agencies, you know, all of those people were doing those things. All of those people had their most important stuff behind the firewall and, you know, and, and were using VPN technology. And the simple truth is there, there's a term in, in the military called broken arrow. And, you know, when a, when a, a, a field officer you know, picks up the mic and says broken arrow. What it basically means is that the enemy has gotten through all of the perimeter defenses and they're inside of the camp. And I would just start yelling broken arrow all the time to corporate America, because if you don't know that they're inside your firewall, you've got an even bigger problem. <laughs> They're in and they're getting in, whether it's it's through stolen passwords, whether it's through phishing attempts and, and, and malware and users clicking on things that they don't. All of these different ways, all of these different attack surfaces, you have to holistically look at them. You then have to apply those, those seven tenets of zero trust. And you have to look at the way you're doing your, your policy, you know, as I said earlier, from, from date of inception all the way through your um, orchestration and, and your um, uh, auditing. And, you know, Rob, you asked specifically about, you know, the enforcement piece and how do you be resilient? Well, I think if you can break down all of those different policy silos, you take your MDM, you take your Linux and Unix that speak a different language than your, you know, on-premise things that you're managing with AD, and you normalize those different policies into, into a, um, for lack of a better term, the term that we use internally is a universal policy. And you make all of those policies speak the same language. And you allow all of those policies to be enforced in a single pane of glass and pushed out, whether, whether on-premise, whether in the cloud, whether it's a, a user that has a, a hybrid lifestyle where they're both on premise and in the cloud, and you enforce those policies. A, a simple example of that is if an organization you know, requires multi-factor authentication and really strong passwords and changing those passwords, the last thing you want is you know, somebody coming in that, that's somewhere outside of your perimeter working as an IT administrator to change by mistake, you know, inadvertently, one of the policies for a user that turns off 
one of those you know things that you've set as a corporate policy in terms of authentication and whether it's using multi-factor authentication or strong passwords or whatever and now you've got what's called policy drift and maybe it doesn't impact the user on premise but it impacts the user in the cloud and so having a dynamic way to constantly be looking at and and reporting on those policies, knowing when a policy has been changed, and if it hasn't gone through the appropriate workflow and been approved, it's dynamically caught and rolled back to the policy that was approved, and boom, the user has what they were supposed to, and they're allowed to work. You know, zero trust simply comes down to we trust no one ever. You literally have to prove at every step from authenticating onto your network all the way down to every application you use and the type of activities that you're using them for, you have to continually prove that you have the right to be there and do the things that you're doing. And policy is the best mechanism for enforcing those things and ensuring that those things stay in place so that the users, you know, uh, we know who they are, they are who they are, and they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. They haven't been hacked. It isn't a bad actor. And even if it's an internal bad actor, when they start elevating privileges or changing the rights and responsibilities, we can catch it and we can roll it back to what it, what it should be. We alert the appropriate people through SIM technology and, and you're able to catch those things. So many of the hacks that have taken place lack that resiliency piece. They lack that ability to know when things are changing dynamically and roll them back. And if they had those, even if there was a breach, it would end up being for several hours or a day, not for months and months. I, I won't call out the company that had the issue, but recently there was a major hack and the company said, yep, we've caught it. We've figured it out. We've locked them out. They got nothing. And the hackers were so spiteful that they went online and posted everything they did, how they were doing it, and the fact that they were still there and they still had access. I mean, it's, it's, it's the wild west when it comes to protecting and locking down all of these corporate assets. And we really do believe that, that normalizing all of these policy silos and having a single pane of glass using that dynamic you know, change management and enforcement and rollback is the best way to protect the organization. And again, it's not one product. It's a lot of different products working together. It's a policy mechanism that enforces the rules and rights and responsibilities, regardless of what the, the, the activity is and regardless of what the security product is that's enforcing the zero trust at every layer of the company stack. Well, well, Bob, I think your, your example that you just kind of walked us through is really interesting. And um, when you think about one of the aspects of trying to keep the attackers out, right, it's, it's making it more difficult for them to get in. And your approach of being you know, persistent on the policy, dynamic on the policy, and being able to roll back makes it more difficult. You talked about the different pillars of zero trust, how this ties back in. Absolutely. Um, and again, making it more difficult for the attacker coming in, it makes them frustrated. They're saying, I'm moving on from this target. It's too difficult. Let me go to the next one. It's, it's a great approach. You make it more resilient as well. So you've tied it all together. We appreciate you joining us here for this episode and sharing policy management and the interconnection to how it helps people be more resilient. So thank you. Thank you guys again for having me on. This was a lot of fun. There's nothing that I like to talk about more than the things that we're doing. And this, this is an exciting time to be in the industry. So thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thanks for listening to the Reimagining Cyber Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you would like to have us cover a specific topic of interest, feel free to reach out to us and you can find out how in the show notes. And don't forget to subscribe. This podcast was brought to you by CyberRes, a micro-focused line of business, where our mission is to deliver cyber resilience by engaging people, process, and technology to protect, detect, and evolve.